Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Edna Scheich. I uh, work for a nonprofit in DC called Civic Nation. And? And I'm Nick Fortuno, and I'm a game designer who runs, uh, co runs a studio called Playmatics. And I'm also the co founder of a festival called Come Out and Play, which has run for the last 12 years and features games played in public. Um, so, what we're here to talk about today is voting. And what's interesting about uh, this one, sorry, remember which keyboard is which. Uh, what's interesting about voting in the United States and what's notable about it is the low participation rate. So in the United States, we see participation rates in presidential elections that run from 50 to 60 percent. Now, this is particularly troubling because that's a presidential election, right, which is probably the most significant and high profile election we have. When we're talking about elections that are lower profile than that, we're looking at 10 to 40 percent participation. And that's particularly troubling because a lot of what goes on in politics that actually affects people's lives happens at the local level. So if we're looking at a participation rate of like 10 to 40 percent uh, in things like local elections, what that means is we're actually not seeing many voters come out for those elections. Um, the things that actually affect people's lives are being decided by a very small number of people. Now, uh, that's really sad because it's unusual for democracies. We're actually at the lowest level in modern democracies, near the lowest, lower than a country like Slovenia, even though we created the concept of modern democracy. So it's quite troubling, actually, that this is happening. Um, and so it, this is a real issue, right? It means that people are not participating in civic life in a way that they should, and they're not being represented. So there's a lot of interest in thinking about you know, how we're going to make things change. So. What we should do first is look at what we're doing to try to solve this problem, because it's not like there aren't people thinking about how to solve these problems. There are a lot of people thinking about these problems, and I don't know if that'll make you feel better or worse. But um, you know, the first thing people do when we talk about getting more people to vote is they want to say, OK, it's really hard to vote, actually. There's a lot of reasons why it's difficult. So why don't we change the laws, and let's make it easier for people to vote. Um, and we believe, obviously, we should do that. We should do anything that makes it easier to vote, anything that takes off uh, even just a hair's breadth um, of a barrier that's keeping people from the polls. So we do um, agree. But unfortunately, if people don't want to vote, they're just not going to vote. And it doesn't matter how easy you make it. So what you see on this slide is basically a lot of the laws um, that have been changed over the past couple of decades um, that um, when you look at it statistically, they don't actually move the needle much. 1% um, for the whole country would be amazing. That's a big step forward, but it doesn't get us to um, where we really want to be, which is a full um, majority of people voting in elections. So um, these work, but not amazingly well. So it's not a policy change that we need. So let's look and see what people do just one-on-one -on -one to get people out to the polls. Um, and what you'll see here is kind of a laundry list of the sort of most typical tactics um, that nonprofit, um, nonpartisan organizations use to get people to the polls. They'll text you, they'll email you, they will, um, what else will they do? They'll send you a robocall, they'll send you a mailer, your, your mailbox will be full of stuff. Um, it doesn't work that well. Again, it's sort of like if people aren't inclined, whoops to vote, <laughs> they're, they're kind of, there's not a ton you can do to convince them um, to do so. And a text does work a little bit. And again, it's scalable. So if I can send a million texts, I'm going to get that percentage of a million people to the polls that wouldn't have already been. Um, and so it's great. We should do that. We should do all these things. Um, at the bottom of the slide, I'll come back to this idea of door to door, um, which as you can see, well, I don't know if you can see because it's a little dark. but it's 7 to 9 percent. 7 it, to 9 percent. If you do a really well done, well trained, neighbor to neighbor, door to door canvas, you will get, <laughs> you, Nick, yeah, thanks. Yeah, you. you will get um, a much bigger bump. The difference is it's really hard to do. You have to train people. You have to coordinate a lot of things. You have to be physically in person. You have to have lists. It's hard. So you do get the effect, um, but you it's harder to um, do than a text message. So. Um, we'll talk more about that in a second. But in the meantime, I'll tell you, those were all nonpartisan numbers. When you're a candidate, or a party, or an issue, and you're talking about climate change, or education, or whatever else, it's going to be worse. You're going to get very, very little impact when you're talking about getting new people to go to the polls. 
um, almost no impact and sometimes detrimental impact. So that doesn't really work. Um, but so, so before anyone gets like really miserable about this, we should <laughs> kind of ask a question about like whether we're, what we're looking at is, is always true. Like have we always had poor turnout? Because maybe that's just like the depressing reality you have to live with or maybe there is something you can change. And the fact is, voter turnout actually used to be higher. There were times in US history where voter turnout was significantly higher. We saw voting rates that were in the 80% range, right, of like 80% of people voting. Um, and that's up to 90% among registered voters. Now, we should keep in mind that when we're talking about the past, 90% of registered voters has a lot of qualifications, right? <laughs> Women weren't voting. There was vast and horrific racial and class inequality. There were, there, there was just different conditions of voting that left huge portions of the population out. But still, getting 90% of even that population is a kind of remarkable number. So we could ask, what was different, right? And the answer would be this. This is what voting looked like. Uh, this is a, a painting of a, of a voting experience. Now, if I asked you just to identify what this was, you probably wouldn't say voting, right? You would probably say this is a party, maybe. Like, there's kids playing games, there's people out in the street, like, there's clearly drunk people in this photo. Yeah, that guy's had too much. Right? Like, the, the idea that this is an experience of voting is really foreign to us, but actually this was the norm for voting. Like, this is what people did. And I think what's interesting about that is it's not what we think about when we think about people engaged in an activity, right? I, I don't know. There is some weird Bluetooth interference. So this, <laughs> this slide stuff is just moving around. So just like treat this as a, maybe you're a little drunk. Right? Maybe you're a little drunk as we talk about voting, which is where we want you. Um, the idea here is that like this activity isn't actually directly related to voting, right? Like no one is actually voting in the, in the drunk stands with the kids playing. But this is right in front of a place where you vote. Um, and so the appeal of this isn't so much that you're voting as you're engaged in a community activity. Like, it would be fun to be at this party. It would be fun to be part of this event. And that leads to kind of an interesting ramification. What if the thing that got some of these voter rates up in the past wasn't anything to do with voting itself, but the conditions of voting, right? We often talk about gamification from the perspective that when we solve the problem with games or play, we have to hone in on this really particular problem and solve for that problem itself. But what if the problem is just a contextual problem? If the problem is getting people to show up, solving the getting people to show up problem might be as easy as just giving them something to do. And what's interesting about this is that in certain parts of the country, this condition has remained, that people do celebrate around voting. And when they do, we see higher voter participation rates. And the example here is Puerto Rico. So, can we, whoops, <laughs> can we, uh, what would happen if we brought more community and fun to voting? Would we see changes in voter participation? Uh, spoiler alert, we do think so, and let me introduce to you Professor uh, Donald Green. He literally, quite literally, as you can see, wrote the book on um, studying voter behavior. Um, and he had a theory that actually if you make voting fun um, and you involve um, games and play, you will see a spike in participation. So he ran a study in 2005-2006. Uh, um, he will tell you if he was here, he would unabashedly say the parties were a little professorial. They were not exactly ragers, as you could tell. Um, this is from one in New Hampshire. They were demure events, um, but they did get 2.7% um, increase in participation and from that earlier slide you'll remember that's pretty good. Um, so we Civic Nation partnered with Professor Green last year and we re-ran the study 10 years later, advent of iPhones, a lot has changed in the past decade um, and we threw um, nine parties across the country, um, very simple events um, right in front of polling locations um, with local organizations um, who went out and told their communities about the party, um, and we got 4.0% impact. So that's percentage points. People who would not have come out to vote came out. We also had puppies, so we had a little bit of an advantage over Professor Green that may have made the difference. Um, but honestly, what you, what you had was really sort of like simple pleasures, hot dogs, ice pops, funny hats, a man in a banana costume, like nothing too fancy. Um, and it really, really worked. And this is just sort of a blip about what we love about this. Besides the fact that it works, it brings people together. It gets people 
thinking in creative ways. It has them um, in a scenario where they can uh, show what they're proud of. If they have a trumpet or we had someone do a dance routine, we had so much um, interaction from the community, cross-generational, cross-sector, um, and a lot of small businesses opened their pockets and donated hot dogs and a bouncy castle and all kinds of fun stuff. So that's what we love about it. Um, and now I'll go back to that last point about door-to-door. -door. We got so many people to do door-to-door -door, um, because all you had to do was invite your neighbor to a party. So now you have someone from your neighborhood coming to your door, asking you to vote, but also inviting you to something fun. Kids came to the door and said they wanted to go. And you know it's just a lovely, delightful experience to go door-to-door. -door. No one's door slammed in anybody's face, as um, if you've been on a canvas is often the case. That did not happen here. Volunteers had a great time. They signed up to do it again. Um, and that's where we see the future of this. In addition to the fun part, there's also um, an ease of kind of inviting people in person to vote. So quickly, I'll say we have big plans for this project. Um, we are expanding this year to 40 sites, of which Nick will be one, and I'll tell you, I'll let him tell you about his project. So as part of Come Out and Play, I'll be running an event in Harlem that's designed to activate Harlem voters by allowing participants of the community to build games and then, and then showcase those games. So coming to vote will be an opportunity to see games that your community made, to play games, and because it's Come Out and Play, it's a high spectacle event, so even if you weren't invited, you're likely to just see it. Um, and then in 2018, we're going big. We're doing at least 300 sites, hopefully up to 1,000. And we would love your help. If you want to do a party, if you want to host a party, if you want to be part of a party, um, let us know. And you can meet this man. I, I don't know. We actually don't have time for questions, but you seem like you really have one. Um, well, <laughs> uh, which one? Um, no, no, she's asking. Um, well, that's a pointed question. I think it's a system, you know, democracy is a pretty great system, and we have um, one that could always use improvement, and that's why our Constitution says we're always headed towards a more perfect union. So, but we see room to grow, of course. Things can always be perfected, but we want to do that with everyone, and we want people to cast their ballot and have their voice be heard, and we believe that's how you change it and make it better. Um, and you know, we don't have a better idea than democracy. And, but if you do, I'm yeah. certainly open to and it. And what I would argue is that what I would argue <laughs> is that perhaps one of the problems that we have with democracy is that at a local election where almost everything is decided that goes on in your community, we see 15% participation. And if 100% of people participated in democracy, we get 100% of voices. And so while we may have particular beliefs about the way things would work, the way things actually work in a democracy is that everyone gets a chance to speak. And then when everyone gets a chance to speak, then we can actually negotiate in the public sphere. But if we don't get everyone to speak, then it is only the partisans who speak. It is only the limited audiences who speak. And in a context where only the limited audiences speak, of course democracy isn't going to work. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>